Hello, this is Elizabeth Davis with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you're watching the Video Voters Guide. We, in conjunction, in conjunction with Metro East Community Media, are here to interview candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Candace Avalos, running for Portland City Commissioner Position 2. Welcome, Candace. Hi, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, let's drive, jump right into the first question. Uh, please tell us a little about yourself, why you're running for this office, and what unique characteristics you have among all candidates for this office. Yes, so my name is Candace Avalo, she, her, hers pronouns. I am a first generation Black Tina, so my mom comes from Guatemala. My grandparents brought her to the country in the 1970s. Um, and then my Black side is from the Deep South Virginia. And so the experiences of my multiracial family really have informed my perspective and my values about democracy um, and are what kind of got me involved in politics from a very young age. So I did student government growing up and that's actually what I do now working with student government leaders at Portland State University. So I work with student government and Greek life and I teach classes on civic engagement and leadership. And I decided that I wanted to practice what I preach to my students, that their voices are important and that we need their voices to help us make decisions for our future. So I got involved with the Police Accountability Board, the Citizen Review Committee, where I served as the acting chair. Um, and through that work, I decided um, there were a lot of things that needed to be addressed in City Hall, like the form of government, like police accountability, like how the city engages with the people. So I decided to run on that. And I, and I feel that what makes me different is being the youngest person in my race, I feel I represent a generation that is left out of the economy and left out of the conversation. Um, so I think that I offer this perspective as a renter, as someone living paycheck to paycheck, as someone that has astronomical student debt. And I think that that perspective isn't really heard in City Hall and those decisions that we're making. So I felt compelled to be that voice on City Council. Great. Uh, the next question is about the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting devastation of small business, city employee layoffs, and housing displacement that will be us for some time. How would you seek to address the fallout, including the reduction in sitting revenue? Well, I think first of all, you know, communication is gonna be really key going forward. And we already had problems with that as far as how the city or different um, agencies are communicating information. And I think that that really leaves the people um, you know, uncomfortable or frightened because they, they see these seemingly uncoordinated actions um, and I think that that's going to be really important for the for city council to be uh, leading on that moving forward. And I think that there's also, you know, there's obviously the physical and the economic and the social um, implications of COVID-19 and also emotional. Um, so I think that we're really going to need to look at our solutions through that lens as well, because we're kind of all going through this collective trauma right now. Um, and whatever those resources are, are going to be you know, obviously we want a better communication with that, but at the same time, we need leaders that are going to be compassionate and are going to be able to lead us in a way that they can kind of get to the heart of um, what we're all feeling um, and help us recover. I do think that we need to be putting more money into small business recovery. I see that Prosper Portland is offering grants. They, um, or well, they offer grants, now they're offering loans. Um, and it just, from what I'm hearing from small business owners, it's just not enough. So I think that we need to figure out how we can adjust our revenue streams to put more money towards that, because that's going to be the first um, important pump that we're going to be put into the, the economy is in small business. And I think that there are a lot of partners we could have in that. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so the third question, if we maintain our current government structure, what city bureau would you want to oversee and why? Well, first I'll say that I um, am running because I wanna change the government structure. So I, I feel strongly that um, the way that it's currently running, it doesn't work for Portlanders. It doesn't work for how we are represented in City Hall. Um, so, you know, I know that League of Women Voters has a, a very specific position on that and I totally agree with that. Um, but as far as what I would do in this current system, I'd really like to take over the Office of Community and Civic Life because I think it's at the heart of so many of the things that I want to address, whether that's engagement with the community, how we are building partnerships with different agencies and community groups that want to make change in City Hall, but they need direction. And I think that that office can really be that voice and kind of guide those, you know, those efforts. And I also think that, you know, in 
the effort to change the form of government, that office is going to need to play a big role because currently they oversee the neighborhood associations and, you know, they recently had that change that they offered to the code, um, which I think was a, a band-aid to a larger problem, which is not having district representation. So I really, I would like to oversee that office because I want to bring the city council into the 21st century. That's a big part of my platform, how we're leveraging technology and those tools. And I think that they're going to need to be the leader on that. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so the next question is, how would you address the public's significant concern, uh, concerns about police slash community relations, use of deadly force, and officer accountability? Well, this is something I definitely have a lot of thoughts about, again, being the acting chair of the Citizen Review Committee, which is a police accountability board for the city of Portland. And we've really struggled over the years um, to have true independence of our review of the police. Um, for example, we have been trying to change our standard of review from a um, reasonable person standard. So would a reasonable person have come to this conclusion? And often that reasonable person is a police officer. So I feel, we feel that we've had to be um, unnecessarily deferential to the police in making those decisions because of our standard. So we have tried to change it to a preponderance so that we can have true um, you know, independent decisions being made based on the evidence. And I think that's a huge first step in addressing our accountability measures. I'm also the acting chair, or I'm sorry, the chair of the crowd control work group as part of the CRC. And that's where we look at, you know, protests and demonstrations, how the police are making decisions to move in on protests and their use of force. And I think that ultimately, you know, city leaders really need to, when they see that the people are protesting, they need to be out there and saying, why are they protesting? And how can we address what they're upset about instead of, you know, kind of pushing it off to the police, well, let's just, you know, clean up the mess and let's just, you know, not let people out in the streets to, to protest. So I think that there's a, a key leadership role that needs to be played by City Hall when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, but again, independent citizen review of the police is crucial. Um, and, and I would like to see um, deadly, deadly force cases included in that review. I think that's going to be a, an important first step in rebuilding that trust so that people feel like these systems that we have in place have actual teeth and that they're doing their job to um, have a citizen perspective on the police. Okay, great. One, uh, we have one minute left. Um, the city's parks system faces serious financial challenges, even more so since the closures caused by the pandemic. What items or what ideas do you have for securing the financial stability of our well-loved park system? Well, as somebody that is on the Oregon Kickball Club board, you know, I care a lot about parks. We are always out in the parks playing our, our sports and, um, you know, it has a really special place in, in a lot of Portlanders hearts. And I think that at the core, what I'd like to see is if we're going to continue to put money into capital investments of parks, there needs to be operational funds that follow that. Because I think that that is the huge disconnect that we see. We put all this money into creating these new spaces, but we're not putting in the money for that personnel and the upkeep. And then we end up with, oh, well, now we have to close these spaces or now we have to lay up all these people, which is what happened last year in the budget process. So I think that overall, you know, in the budget, there's a lot I could say about how we manage the budget. I know we're not, we don't have all the time in the world to do that, but I think that's at the core of our issue with dealing with parks is how, who gets to decide, you know, what that values-based budgeting process is. Right now it's currently the mayor, but I don't see it being super inclusive of all the commissioners who oversee those bureaus. So that's where the disconnect happens because we don't work together. Sorry, I gotta stop you right there. We're out of time. We appreciate you meeting and talking with us. Of course, thanks for having mm -hmm, Of course. This has been the Video Voters Guide. Thank you for watching. The election is Tuesday, May 19th. Be sure to inform yourself about the candidates and ballot measure and exercise your right to vote.